Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the prayer um, to the class this evening. I was going to say the prayer call. How is your week gone? The month is almost at an end, and um, so is the year coming fast to an end. We're still in the study of the book of Exodus, the prophetic study of the book of Exodus. And today we'll be looking at Exodus chapter 8. Last week we looked at Exodus chapter 7. And we saw the beginning of the plagues. We saw the plague of the blood um, that, the, um, that the Lord put upon, turned the water of the Nile and all the waters around um, Egypt to blood. And um, we saw Pharaoh's response. We looked at a number of things last week. And um, just as we're starting, I need to share the links so that other people may come in. But if you remember one thing you learned from last week, it would be nice to hear it. What did you learn last week? Please share with me so that we can go on. I'm just trying to kill time for about two, three minutes while I, I invite your brothers and sisters to come in. So while you're at it, also share. Welcome, everyone. Please share the link as you're at it. And then remind me of something you learned last week that, you'd, um, that you took home with you, something that stuck with you through the teaching from last week. If you share with me, I'd be grateful. While I'm waiting for you to share, can we just begin to thank the Lord for the opportunity to come and learn at his feet again? As you're praying, invite, invite the Holy Spirit to come. That we'll not try to do this by ourselves, but by his Spirit, he will come, he will teach us of himself. And as, as his word says, great will be our peace in the name of Jesus. Just invite every um, the Holy Spirit to come. Even as we submit our learning this evening, commit the hearts and the minds of those who would listen this evening into the hands of God. That everything we do would be, they will be acceptable or recept, receptive of what the Lord, the word that the Lord will bring them this evening. In the name of Jesus, let's just thank the Lord Lent in the process. So please just um, invite someone to come in, share the link. Please, the Lord bless you as you do so. Please share the link and let's just get people to come. I trust that God will speak to us this evening. And I trust that whatever he says to you, you will be able to use it for your life. Have you shared the link yet? Our Father and our God, we just submit to you. We ask that you come and have your way. Teach us by your spirit, O God, and let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen and amen. So I was asking if anybody learned anything last week that they'd like to share with me. No one has shared, so I'm just going to go on to this week's class because it's um, test of spirits. Because, it's, because it is supernatural, it does not make it God. Yes, that was one very vital point from last week. So we should always test the spirit or test every spirit and uh, recognize them. Supernatural does not, and um, that a miracle shows that something supernatural has happened. It doesn't mean that God has happened. Okay, so um, let's quickly go on to Exodus chapter 8. We have about 35 verses and, and um, we have um, a number of, pari of uh, plagues to plow through. But I know the Lord will help us because they are pretty straightforward. Um, so I'll read from verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go so that they may serve me. However, if you refuse to let them go, hear this, I am going to strike your entire land with frogs. The Nile will swarm with frogs, which will come up and go into your home into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants and on your people and into the ovens and your kneading bowls. So the frogs will come up on you and on your people and all your servants. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the streams and canals, over the pools, among the reeds, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians and soothsayer priests did the same thing 
with their secret arts and enchantments and brought up more frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and said, plead with the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people and I will let the people go so that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, I am entirely at your service. When shall I plead with the Lord for you and your servants and your people so that the frogs may leave you and your houses and remain only in the Nile? Then Pharaoh said, tomorrow, Moses, then Pharaoh said, tomorrow, Moses replied, may it be as you say, so that you may know without any doubt and acknowledge that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave your houses and leave your servants and your people, and they will only remain in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, and Moses cried out to the Lord as he had agreed to do, concerning the frogs which the Lord had inflicted on Pharaoh. The Lord did as Moses asked, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the courtyards and villages, and out of the fields. So they piled them up in heaps, and the land was detestable and stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was temporary relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen or pay attention to them, just as the Lord had said. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. The first plague, like we saw last week, was the plague of the um, was the plague of the of the blood where um, Aaron stretched his rod and the waters of the Nile and all the waters in the land became blood and the magi magicians stretched their rods as well and they brought forth more blood in the waters in the land. And we saw that um, even though it was all those things happened, the moment um, the magicians could, um, or the, yes, the magicians of Egypt could um, match that same um, um, plague or do the same feat, perform the same feat, um, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he wasn't going to budge. We saw how God um, still um, left, made a way of escape uh, for mercy. They could dig around the Nile and they could find water. They could find water to drink. But the entire land of Egypt had no water because all the waters had turned to blood. In the end, we saw that Pharaoh was not budging. Now, what we have seen now is that the, this is the second um, plague that we had just read about. So the next day, God sent Pharaoh to, uh, Moses to Pharaoh again and said, go and tell Pharaoh that I am about to um, bring frogs upon the land. They will emanate from the Nile and they will stretch to everywhere. They will be in the bedrooms. They will be on the beds. They will be in, your, in their kneading bowls. They will be in their ovens. Everywhere you turn, it will be frogs. And... Um, his, he gave Pharaoh again the opportunity to change his mind. But Pharaoh refused, and so the Lord told Aaron and Moses what to do. And it called off, called, um, they stretched the road, and the, uh, the frogs came. And the frogs covered everywhere. Pharaoh's magicians did the same thing, and more frogs came up. I don't get them, but I get them. I don't get because if I want something, if something is plaguing me, I will not be doing anything to increase the number of the things that are plaguing me. That's why I don't get them. However, I get them because like I said last week, the devil cannot do anything constructive. He is to kill. His ministry is kill, still destroy. He's not able to give anything of value. If the devil takes gifts to you, he will take more from you. Or if you think the devil gave to you, he will and what's the word? He would um, take much more from you. So there is no, um, there is nothing that the devil gives to anybody. Um, so while there was, there were frogs all over the place. They stretched forth their rods. What I would expect is that the rod that is is um, stretched would reduce the number of frogs, but instead the number of frogs increased. Again, to buttress that the devil has nothing to give anyone. But as we saw in the scriptures we have read, Pharaoh actually was, for a minute, felt the pressure of waking up. I don't know how we'll see frogs all over the place in one, in, you know, not, that means that there was no space. It was just all frogs. They're slimy and, but that was what they had. And um, Pharaoh 
The Bible said that Pharaoh called on, on, on Moses and asked him to entreat the Lord for him. Remember in chapter 7, God said to Moses, he said, you will be God to Pharaoh and Aaron will be your mouthpiece. That is already manifesting because Pharaoh can't talk to God directly. He had to speak to Moses so that Moses could speak to God. He said, look, talk to God. Let him call off these frogs and I will do exactly what the Lord wants. I will let his people go. But of course, that didn't happen. But before we get into all of that, there are a number of things that I want to highlight for you to see. I have told you that the devil doesn't give anything. He only takes. And if it seems like he's giving you something, you can be sure that he's going to take more from you. So you don't deal with the devil. You don't, um, what's the word? Yes. You don't trade with the devil. You don't deal with him. You don't, because all that he he's out there to do is take from you. He has nothing positive. He has nothing advantageous. He has nothing of value to add to you. That's number one. Number two, um, the frogs, all the plagues in, in this chapter represented gods. They represented, they had something to do with either the, the gods of Egypt or the, um, or the mode of worship. So they had a, a god that was uh, represented by the head of a frog. And so... The reason why it was difficult, according to some um, the research that I did, the reason why it was difficult for the magicians to kill the frogs was because they worshipped a god that had the head of a frog. And so that would be sacrilegious to kill what they worship. So instead of killing, they called up, uh, they called, <coughs> they called up more frogs in the land. The magicians made more frogs. Pharaoh now and treated Moses to call them off. Moses asked him to determine when the miracle should happen, and he did. When you see that the tendency is you can walk away and just gloss over the fact that Pharaoh and uh, Moses will give Pharaoh the opportunity to determine when he wanted the frogs to be called off. I think that Moses did that because he wanted to establish to Pharaoh that our God is sovereign and our God is good and our God is kind and our God is powerful. So he said to him, you need to just tell me when you want me to, when you want the frogs to be called off. Of course, of course, Pharaoh said the very next day. And Moses said, not a problem. Moses stepped out of Pharaoh's presence and treated the Lord. By the next morning, all the frogs had died. But then they now had to gather them and the whole place stank. When you refuse to, to do the will of God, let, I need you to pay attention to this. And a, a, a refusal to do the will of God always comes with consequences. The Lord will forgive you <coughs> for being hard-hearted and all of that, <coughs> or pig-headed if you like. But in the end... There is always a consequence. The consequence of Pharaoh not heeding because the, the plague of the frogs were announced to him up front. The consequence of his not heeding and doing what the Lord wanted was that the frogs could not be returned into the sea. They had to die. And in dying, they had to gather them up in heaps. And everywhere they gathered them up, the entire place stank. Just so you know that sin stinks. And I say it one more time. Sin stinks. The scripture says when you, in the day, you know, when the Lord will speak or something, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts. When you harden your hearts or when we harden our hearts on the things that God is asking us, talking to us about or asking us to make adjustments about, when the day comes, the sin, the consequence of the sin will stink. The consequence of the sting, sin will stink. It doesn't mean that God will not forgive you. It doesn't mean take anything away from the fact that God loves you. But the Bible says, he that breaks the hedge, the serpent will bite. So when sin is in the house, there are some things that we do and naturally a consequence will follow. Naturally, a consequence will follow. I could give you many examples. But you see, when you break what God has said should not be broken and you come back and you repent, he'll forgive you.
But some of those, these things come with consequences. So that was what happened. The moment they refused, Pharaoh re hardened his heart. And eventually he said, okay, I, re I, I step back, just have mercy, talk to God about me. And then let God just have mercy. God said, sure, I'll have mercy. But there will be something you would need to do. You will have to pick the frogs. You will gather them in one place and then you have to watch them decompose, which means that the entire land of Egypt will stink for the number of days it takes for the frogs to decompose and dry up. Sin stinks. So even if you didn't hear anything today, hear that. Sin has a stench. You don't want to be caught up in the stench of sin. I know people don't agree anymore. I know we have glamorized sin in all kinds of ramifications. But honestly, let me tell you, sin stinks. It stinks to the high heaven. Whether it's, it's pretentious, uh, pretentious sin or a sin that is outrightly perpetrated, whatever kind, sin stinks. And the stink would always rub off, or uh, yes, on the one who did the sin. So let's see that. So Pharaoh entreated. The Lord said, it's fine. I'll um, let the frogs die. But Pharaoh changed his mind. And that was crazy. When I saw it, I was like, seriously, this guy? But you see, God has said to him already, sent to us already, that Pharaoh was hiding his heart. So God gave him the permission or God helped him harden his heart more. I saw someone ask the question. She said, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Because God knows the end of a thing from the beginning. It wasn't that Pharaoh was not inclined to hardening his heart. It was already, some, already something that Pharaoh did. Last week, I told us that that one of the reasons why God said I will harden Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh had already asked. He said, who is the Lord that I might listen to him? Who is the Lord that I might listen to him? So God said, well, he doesn't want to listen to me. He's not paying attention. So I will do something. I will harden his heart. If he would not repent, then perdition will be his portion. Do you understand that? So even now we see that Pharaoh says, when Pharaoh saw the frogs, he had a rethink. And he says, oh, Moses, please entreat the Lord for me. I would let you guys go so that you can serve the Lord. And Moses was ecstatic. But the Bible said, the, the version that we read in the Amplified, it said that, but when, verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was temporary relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen or pay attention to them, just as the Lord has said. Again, for the person who asks, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh had the uh, free moral agency. Remember, I talk about free moral agency a lot. So Pharaoh could make up his mind and say, um, Pharaoh could have chosen and said, look, I don't want to get in a fight with the God of heaven. I will do what he wants. But Pharaoh decided that he wanted to do his own will. That was why it's what you present to God that God amplifies for you. The Bible says it like this. You sow the wind, you reap the wild wind. So Pharaoh had already sowed the wind when he said, um, how did he say it? He said, who is the Lord that I might listen to him? And plus, God knows Pharaoh. The Bible says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But I, the Lord, I search at the heart. So the Lord already knew what Pharaoh was going to do. God was just following Pharaoh's lead. So it wasn't that his heart was hardened for a punishment. However, God also said that because Pharaoh presented the opportunity, God will ride on that opportunity to announce to all of Egypt and the consequence there of the entire world that he is the sovereign God, that he is the sovereign God. So by this first plague, the plague reveals that God's sovereignty reveals God's so the plagues in this chapter reveals um, reveal um, God's sovereignty in three dimensions. The first dimension is that God is sovereign over his creation. The frogs will obey him. They will obey him to come out of the sea and, and cover the entire expanse of land of Egypt. And they will obey him when he says to them to die. You need to know that God is the God of the universe. It is not a title. It is who he is. It is not something somebody sat somewhere and conjured and said, let's call him the God of the universe. He is called the God of the universe because he is indeed the God of the universe. 
He is sovereign. And as long as the creation was his, by his hand, he is sovereign. He has sovereignty over them. He has sovereignty over them. Verse 8 says, Pharaoh entreated the Lord. Pharaoh's first acknowledgement of God. Remember in chapter 5, his question was, who is the Lord that I might listen to him? It's break, getting broken little by little. In chapter 8, verse number 8 He's now entreating Moses to entreat the Lord. It means that Pharaoh was beginning to see that he was no match. Him and his magicians and the gods of Egypt are no match for the God of heaven. So ultimately, God is sovereign over his creation. And that includes Pharaoh. Let's go on. Moses gives Pharaoh the leeway. I talked about this a bit. The leeway to set the time. He said to Moses, he said to Moses, Stop God. Moses said, when do you want the frogs to, to die or to cease? And he said, tomorrow. Why did Moses do that? Because Moses wanted him to know that God can match everything. Actually, it's not God matching. It's God is in charge of everything. He said, I want it tomorrow. You know, Moses didn't have to come back to him to say, ha, God is not available tomorrow. He's, he can't do it. Or God is not able to do it tomorrow. He's, um, he's ill. Oh, God has a cold. Tomorrow is not a good day. Moses did not need to come back to say any of those things. He just said, okay, is that what you want? That's what you get. He said, you want tomorrow? Tomorrow it is then. By tomorrow, all the frogs had died. Did the Bible not say that believers can, shall decree a thing and it shall be established? Pharaoh said, that's what I want. Moses went to God and said, Lord, that is what I want. This is what Pharaoh is asking. I gave him the opportunity to do that. And that's what we've got to do. What is all of this about? Moses told Pharaoh, he said, so that, let me read it in verse number nine. Verse 10. Then Pharaoh said tomorrow, Moses replied, may it be as you say, so that you may know without any doubt. And acknowledge that there is no one like our God. There is no one like our God. What did the Bible say? Except they see signs and wonders, they shall not believe. This was Moses proving to Pharaoh that God is in charge of everything. I have a feeling that if Pharaoh had said he wanted it done right that time, God would have done it. Because remember, God does not desire the death of sinners. He wants them to come to repentance. And sometimes in coming, bringing them to repentance, he needs to um, exhibit his power for them to see. But of course, Moses reneged on his promise. And when you hear Moses renege on his promise, the tendency is you'll be thinking that Moses guy is just a silly person. Why did he renege on a promise he's done? But has it not happened to you and me? When we're in a hard place, we pray until our speech will dry up. We make all kinds of promises to God. Oh Lord, if you deliver me, I will walk with my head. Oh Lord, if you deliver me, I will never miss church again. Oh Lord, if you deliver me, I will do X, Y, Z, and then some. Then deliverance comes. You follow through on your, oh, on your vows and your pledges or your whatever for three months, max six months. If you, are, if you really tried one year, then life will happen. And the moment life happens, guess what happens? We go back. Once things become, once the hardship eases and we become better, or things become better around us, the first thing we always forget or the first thing we choose to relegate to the back burner is usually the God thing. Why that is our default, I do not know. But that was exactly what Pharaoh was exhibiting here. Pharaoh said, ah, this is hard, help me. The moment he got reprieve, he just went back. Once respite is achieved, Pharaoh reneges in, on his promises. Reminds me of all the promises and, and sometimes vows we make when our own frogs manifest or show up. And how quickly we forget once our frog, when we get our respite or our frogs die. Or our frogs die. Adversity has a way of catching our attention and helping us gain perspective which isn't a bad thing as long as we are able to keep and continue our new mindset once we receive respite. 
But I don't think I don't think we recognize that we cannot that God is not a little child that you keep saying, I will give you sweet tomorrow, I'll give you biscuit the next day, and I will give you chewing gum the next day. That's not God, but that's the way we treat God. We come and we're like, oh, ah, Father, deliver me. If you deliver me, I will be somersaulting 50 times a day. He delivers you. You somersault 25 times and you think to yourself, why did I even make that ridiculous vow? 50 times is too much. Nobody's even watching me. It's not adding value. Da, 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 da. And you see us cutting back. You see us cutting back. So I'm not surprised that Pharaoh did that. And since this is not a journey of Pharaoh alone, this is us taking a look at ourselves through the lens of the life of Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his dealings with God. The question I want to ask is how many times have you stepped back simply because you had received, um, what's it called? Because you had received respite. If we sat down today and we ask you to begin to do a list of the things that you had, promised and you have failed to deliver on simply because you no longer feel the pain that you were feeling how many things will they be how many things will you have to show for all the things that you promised and you did not follow through on some of us are dealing with another plague simply because we did not keep our last promise some of us are dealing with another plague today because we did not keep the promise when the first plague showed up because Pharaoh did not keep this promise. The Lord is going to call another plague. The Lord is going to call forth another plague. The next plague, which will be a third plague out of 10, is the plague of the lies. The plague of the lies. And we will see the story from verse number um, 16, I believe. From verse number 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the, the dust of the ground. And it will become biting gnats, lice throughout the land of Egypt. They did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were biting gnats on man and animals. All the dust of the land became gnats through all the land of Egypt. The magicians, the soothsayer priests, tried by their secret arts and enchantments to create gnats, but they could not. And there were gnats on man and animal. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, I need you to pay attention. This is the supernatural finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them. Just as the Lord had said. If you notice, every time the hardness of Pharaoh's heart is highlighted, they remind us that the Lord has said that that's what will happen. But let's not go there first. Let's go to the lies. Let's go to the lies. Let's go to the lies. It is the, um, the, the third plague. And if you remember last week, I told you that the plagues were categorized 3-3. Three, 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 one, and that the last one was a standalone plague, the plague of the firstborn, of the death of the firstborn. But every other plague, uh, the other nine plagues were categorized in three threes. And if I said to you that the first two, in all three categories, the first two, Pharaoh always received a warning. But in the third one of the three sets, Pharaoh did not receive, receive a warning. The, 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 the plague of the lice or the nangs or the mosquitoes of the biting insects is the one in this first category, category of three that they did not get... Um, Pharaoh did not get notice that was going to happen. The Lord just said, let Aaron strike the ground, strike the dust of the ground, and the lice will be all over the place. They will be as the dust that was struck. And that was exactly what happened. Now you'll be like, what is the significance of the plague of the lice? What is this? You see, in Egypt, um, the priests, if you like, and the magicians and all of those people who... Uh, offer sacrifices on behalf, on behalf of the people, pride themselves, themselves in cleanliness. They are consistently clean. It is for them, it is a taboo to be unclean, to be dirty at any level. And here we have priests who had lice, not just on their head, all over their body. It looks trying to prove to them that even their God could not save them. Because I mean, if they, they were, if they were keeping themselves clean so that they could, um, 
They could worship. It would be easy for them to worship their, the gods that they worship. Why couldn't that God save them? But of course, he didn't save them because there is no other name by which any man will be saved except that which he was given, the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to see it. So after the frogs came the lies. They came the lies and um, yet Pharaoh had in his heart. But I like the fact that this time, under this particular plague, the magicians actually counseled Pharaoh. They said to Pharaoh, said, this is the hand of God. This is the supernatural finger of God. When the ones who used to compete with the things that the Lord is doing, begin to acknowledge in your life, that the finger of God or the hand of God is upon you. It is worthy of giving praise to God concerning. The same people that were throwing their rods on the ground and turning them to snakes because they saw a, a rod come become snake. The same people who called, who uh, conjured up more blood on the Nile. The same people who called up um, more frogs. We're now saying this is the finger of God. Do you know why they were saying this is the finger of God? Because they tried to conjure up more lies and they couldn't. They could not perform this miracle. Just so that God was proving to them that just because you were, you, you were able to do the last two did not mean that I was low on power. It was just that I was giving you the opportunity. This one they tried and they couldn't do it. They stretched out their rods and nothing happened. Based on that, they had to say. They were unable to duplicate it, and the, 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 this particular plague. So they had to say to Pharaoh, they said, this is hard. There's no other explanation for this, but that this is the supernatural finger of God. You, you will think that when his, um, his priest and um, whatever would counsel him and say to him, we see God in this. You would think that Pharaoh would step back. But the Bible says Pharaoh had in his heart. You know, there's a saying that say, whom the gods want to destroy, they first make mad. Yes, it's not biblical, but it's a saying. So Pharaoh was bent on his own destruction. And you look at that and you be like, I can never be like Pharaoh. This Pharaoh is really stupid. But really seriously, are we not like him sometimes? How many times did God say to you that something was not good? Did you not do it? And then your mindset is, well, I will repent later. It doesn't matter how it presents. I know we are not um, in Pharaoh's um, shoes, so it's not exactly the same. But however your own hard-heartedness had, had, um, had, had presents, the finger of God ought to make you take two steps back. We ought to step back. But what do we do? No. We know more than the God. He said, this is the finger of God. This is the finger of God. Pharaoh was warned again. He was warned about the frogs, but he wasn't warned now. But he refused. He refused. And he was even told, he said, look, do something. Just change your, ch just let these people go so they might worship. He said no. He said no. Pharaoh wasn't warned about this. Sometimes God may not warn us. That's something I need to highlight. Sometimes God may not warn you. Sometimes God may not warn you. You may not find someone preaching to you and telling you to change. There may be no conviction of the Holy Spirit sometimes. The Bible says, He that knoweth to good, do good and doeth it not. For to him it is a sin. It's not everything that God is not a nag. It's not everything that he will be coming every five minutes to tell you to readjust. You ought to know by now the things that make for your godliness. And we ought to follow those, that straight. So why Pharaoh was probably waiting, they will soon come and tell me that another plague is going to happen. After all, they said they were going to turn. But nobody warned him. He just woke up and there were lies all over the place. That would mean that Pharaoh had lies too. Oh my God. So if God doesn't warn all of the time, doesn't that scare you? It scares me. 
to think that ha there will be a day that god will not just say anything to me will just do what he wants to do god forbid i don't want to be on that side of the divide on that day but then the bible says that the day of the lord will come as a thief in the night that he will just return there will be nobody shouting and screaming he's coming he's coming because prior to this time, many people would have said, he's there, he's there, he's that, he's that, he's coming, and nothing would have happened. So men and women would have relaxed. And they would be like, that was how they said he was going to come in Y2K. He didn't come. Then they said he was going to come in 2010. He did not come. And so if you relax and you let your guard down, the Bible says he will come as a thief in the night. It's not everything that you are going to receive a warning from. All the warning that you would get are the warnings you are getting now. When it truly matters, when it truly really matters, there will be no warning. Read your Bible. There's no way in Revelation it said that uh, God, it said this trump will just sound suddenly. And if that is the case, you want to make sure that you are living ready. Live ready is the, is the, is the motto. Make sure that you are ready 247. Just in case the trump sounds. Now, I know some people will be like, oh, there are many signs in the Bible that God said would happen before the trump was sound. They're already happening. That's number one. But number two, do you know that everyone's um, rapture happens sometimes? Um, everyone who's died in Christ so far, their rapture happened earlier than, that, than for us. So you can't tell exactly when it is going to happen for you. And that is the reason why you must live ready. That is the reason why you must live ready. We are not in. When. We, let me see. I'm trying to read my notes. It says. Um, it's not in every case that we will be given the opportunity not to partake up front, especially when we are not on sentence. On, when we are not maintaining our relationship or nurturing it, it is a, the man in the place of intimacy that will probably sense what is going to happen. Now, in the last four weeks, I, I've been saying to those who are close to me, I said, something is off. Something is off. Something has been off. I know something is off, but I didn't know what it is. So part of what I did was I was living ready. I just knew things were off. And a lot of things have unfolded in that time that showed that, look, you don't take these things for granted. It's, it's one thing to know something is off. It's another thing to know what is off. All I knew was something is off. So I told who, as many as I could tell them something is off. And then I started to put myself, my own house in order just in case I'm, the off is off in me. But here's, that's the point is that we need to live ready. The magicians couldn't reproduce this one. Why? Could it be because they didn't have time to prepare? I don't think so. I think that it's because God just wanted to show them up, to let them know that you don't have power. Everything that you get to do, I do because I, you do because I allow you to. I, you do because I allow you to. If I didn't allow you, you would not be able to do it. If I didn't allow you, you would not be able to do it. Now, all of the plagues we are looking at today prove that God is what? Sovereign over his creation. The frogs are his creation. The lice or the gnats are his creation. Then we have the last plague, the plague of the flies. For today, I mean, let's go to the Bible, the plague of the flies. From verse number 20. Now the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he is coming out of the water of the Nile. This is our fourth plague. And say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may serve me. For if you do not let my people go, hear this. I will send swarms of blood sucking insects on you and your servants and on your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians will be full of swarms of insects, as well as the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will separate and set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of insects will be there, so that you may know without any doubt and acknowledge that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the earth. I will put a division, distinction between my people and your people. 
By tomorrow, this sign shall be in evidence. Verse 24, then the Lord do, did so. And there came heavy and oppressive swarms of blood-sucking insects into the house of Pharaoh and his servants' houses. In all the land of Egypt, the land was corrupted and ruined because of the great invasion of the insects. Do you see that? So this is the fourth plague again because this is the beginning of another set of three. God once sends Moses to, to one Pharaoh. He said, look, I'm going to do this. If you do not let my people go, I'm going to send swarms of insects upon you. And there will be blood-sucking insects. There will be horrible. But if you let my people go, you will not need to experience this. But if you do not let my people go, here's what's going to happen. I will make a distinction between you and my people in Goshen. All the things that will plague you will not come nigh them. All the things that will plague you will not come near them. Pharaoh was warned again. This will not happen in Goshen. That thou mayest know. God was making the distinction just so that Pharaoh will know that he is the God who rules in the affairs of men. He is sovereign over his, the, creations, the creation of his hands. And that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Always the same goal to introduce Pharaoh to God. God was so interested in just getting Pharaoh to know that he is God. You'll be wondering, why is God so interested in Pharaoh finding out, you know, recognizing and acknowledging? Remember what we talked about last week. No, um, no acknowledge, was it again in verse number, chapter 7. Let me look for it. It was three words. Who remembers them? That thou may know. I'm looking for it. So. My eyes are not opening, no. I can't see them. But do you, yes, there is acknowledge that I know that there are things. I remember because I didn't have it in my notes. They popped at me as I was teaching and I talked about them. And I didn't remember to put them in my notes after. But where were the words again? Acknowledge, there were three words. I need to find them. Um, yes, you will know, recognize and acknowledge. No, yes, thank you, so you will know that's in verse 17. You will know you will recognize and you will acknowledge everything that God was doing. The reason why he was warning Pharaoh was he wanted Pharaoh to know. He wanted Pharaoh to recognize and he wanted Pharaoh to acknowledge. Up to tomorrow, the reason why men and women are sent to us, the reason why we have the Holy Spirit who convicts us of all sins, the reason why all of these things happen around us is because God wants us to know, recognize and acknowledge. God wants us to know, recognize and acknowledge that he and he alone is the God of all flesh. But do we do that? I, last week I said that some of us know, we just refuse to acknowledge. Some of us know, we acknowledge, we just refuse, uh, no recognize, we just refuse to acknowledge. But until the three comes, because acknowledgement is where you begin to make the decision to do a turnaround. Acknowledgement is when you make the decision to do the turnaround. So you need to, you need to do that. You need to do that. You need to know. You need to acknowledge. Otherwise, it will just be a waste of time. So the question is, what do you know about God? What do you acknowledge about him? What do you recognize about God? What do you recognize about God? What do you recognize about God? All of these things are important. We need to know, we need to recognize, and we need to acknowledge because until we do that, it will just be hard. It will be hard. So do you know, do you recognize, and do you acknowledge? Do you know, do you recognize, and do you acknowledge? Do you know, do you recognize, and do you acknowledge? 
Do you know, do you recognize, and do you acknowledge? That's a question, and we need to answer. We need to answer it. Okay, so let's go on to the next um, plague. So Pharaoh was warned, but because God wanted to bring him to the place where he recognizes that God is God, but he did not. And because he did not, The magicians were not mentioned in this particular one. Maybe the magicians had given up at this point. Maybe, maybe not. But this time, Pharaoh decides to negotiate. Let's read it in the scripture. Pharaoh decides to negotiate. Something is distracting me, but I'm just going to ignore it. It says um, in verse number 25, let me see. Everything that God said he would do, he did. Verse 24, then the Lord did so, and there came a heavy, heavy oppressive swarms of blood-sucking insects into the house of Pharaoh and his servants, and his servants' houses in all the land of Egypt. And the land was corrupted and ruined because of the great invasion of insects. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go, sacrifice to your God here in the land of Egypt. But Moses said, it is not right for or even possible to do that. For we will sacrifice to the Lord our God what is repulsive and unacceptable to the Egyptians. That is, the, that is animals that the Egyptians consider sacred. If we sacrifice what is repulsive and unacceptable to the Egyptians, will they not riot and stone us? We must go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he commands us. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go so that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far, far away. Plead with your God for me. Moses said, I'm going to leave you and I will urgently petition, pray and pray to the Lord that the swarms of insects may leave Pharaoh and his servants and his people tomorrow. Only do not let Pharaoh act, act deceitfully again by not letting the people go to sacrifice. The point in this is that, number one, Pharaoh starts to, begins to try to negotiate with, um, Pharaoh tries to begin to negotiate with um, Moses. He said, why don't you just, if you, I, I don't have a problem with you offering sacrifices to your God, but what if you just did it here? What if you did it here? That was what Pharaoh was saying. He said, just have it here. It's okay. You can sacrifice to your God here. But you see, when the devil wants to trick us, he says to us that, um, how does he say it? He says to us that these things don't matter. And he wants to push us to the place of compromise. So he said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said to Moses, he said, look, you want to worship your God and then worship him in, his, in Egypt. Just go and worship him there. Do all your sacrifices. But Moses had to be firm. Moses said, no, I can't do that because what we offer as sacrifice to our God is what are the animals you serve. And if we do that, it will cause a riot and they will stone us. See, sometimes the devil will give you something. That's where you hear things like, at least not be me, kill Jesus. You hear expressions like, um, it does not matter. After all, you will. Once it becomes something that they have to explain and rub their hand on your head to get you to agree. You need to take two steps back. Compromise is real. Pharaoh wanted Moses to compromise. He said, don't go, do it here. Moses said, no, we can't do it here. Then guess what he says now? It's okay, you can go, but don't go really far. I guess Moses was saying, as long as we get out of Egypt, we can go as far as we want to go. But of course, that didn't work ultimately because Pharaoh again by the next day had reneged on the promise that he had made. But the point is, the devil will always want you so um, what's the word? He will always want you to compromise. He will say to you, that's not as sinful as they make it to be. He will show you scriptures and say, they said a little wine is good for the stomach. They will say with all of those things. And all of it that he wants you to do is just to let your guard down so that he can come in. Moses takes Moses disagrees and helps him see how that won't work. As they, the Israelites, will be sacrificing animals that the Egyptians worship. An abomination the Egyptians will call it ultimately. 
So Pharaoh concedes to that and says, okay, why don't you just go and not go far away? And Moses said, okay, that's fine. I will intercede to God for you. I will intercede before God for you, but make me a promise that you will not change your mind. So Moses asked the Lord and the Lord did as Moses asked, verse 31, and removed the swarms of the blood sucking insects from Pharaoh, his servants, and from his people. Not one remained, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also, and he did not let the people go. Pharaoh is praying, playing hide and seek with God, if you like. He reminds me of you and me. Dakudaji Christians. Today we're standing, tomorrow we're on our face. Simply because we don't want to consistently push and do what God has called us to do. The thing about doing the will of God, you know, when people say it's very hard to do the will of God, I say that's because you have not partnered with the Holy Spirit. If you're partnering with the Holy Spirit, it gets easier by the day. The more intimate you get with him, the easier it gets for you to be able to do it. The more intimate you get with him, the easier it gets for you to be able to do with, deal with him. The more intimate you get with him, the easier it gets for you to be able to do the will of God. The point is that even Moses is maturing in this time. You see, hardship has a way of form, reforming the character of believers. And so when the Bible says that I have refined you in the furnace of affliction, or God enlarges me in the place of my distress, even Moses was getting better. Moses was not losing his mind again. He didn't, four times now, Pharaoh had reneged on his promise. And Moses is now going crazy and telling God, when would this end? Moses is now taking his time because Moses is growing through the process. Now, all of that to say to you that sometimes when the devil begins to press at us from on all sides, and it looks like the, the Lord is not um, doing anything to make these things let up. The reason why it doesn't happen is because God is reforming us too. We are going through the process of transformation. So there are many things we've talked about today. Number one, we've talked about the fact that when we, we would make vows, we would make promises, and when we have a little bit of respite, we will take a step back. I talked to you about the frogs representative of the goddess that the Egyptians worshipped. I talked to you that all of these um, plagues, indicates that God is God over his creation. God is God over his creation. I also showed to you that the devil will want to give you what looks like the real deal, but it's not the real deal. Because unless Moses had stood, Moses had not stood where he was and insisted, you know, some of us would think she be sacrificed to God is sacrifice to God. If Pharaoh will not let us go, we can sacrifice here and now. But you see, you need to know that when the Lord gives us instructions, he's very specific about his instructions. And unless he changes his instructions, we ought not to change his instructions simply because we now want to accommodate others or we want to make room for them. I'm talking to you as much as I'm talking to myself this morning, this evening. So the plagues are progressing. We're seeing God doing everything to get the children of Israel out without having to destroy lives. But Pharaoh is not paying attention. And again, I want to ask us, what will it take for us to listen to God? Me and you. Let's not talk about Pharaoh. Pharaoh's fate is decided. We saw it. But for you and me, our fate is still, the Lord is still on the throne and he still has mercy. What will it take for you to follow through on the plans that God has for you? What is it that you need to do so that you can be standing where God has called you to stand? What are the tiny, tiny step down in the standard of God that you are doing that with, when they, they, they culminate ultimately will become huge compromise on your side? What are the things that you are doing now that you shouldn't be doing? I also told us that sin stinks. I said sin, sin stinks. That there are consequences for some of the things that we do. God definitely forgives us. But then we have to now live with the consequence of a pile of frogs of frogs that are stinking up the entire neighborhood. What do you have your hand in right now that if 
God does not, <laughs> will begin to stink. At what point are you going to take your hands away from that till and just let God be God? When are we going to do that? You know, when I look at the book of Exodus, I don't know if I've said this enough times, but I need to say it one more time. You'll be like, oh, the study of Exodus is not like the study of Joshua. Yes, because the study of Exodus is the journey of a brand of a believer with God. We're seeing now all of this that we're looking at is the negotiation that it took for God to be able to get us away from the clutches of the devil. See the extent to which God went to be able to get you out of the clutches of the devil. Now one day he says that you should not take such great a salvation for granted. Look at all the things that God did to bring the children of Israel out. When we now get to uh, uh, further chapters, when they begin to murmur and do those things that, more, that they do, you want to wonder whether they were there and they witnessed what it took for God to bring them out. But this is not just history. The word of God is not history. The word of God is life. So we're not reading a history book. We're looking at templates for dealing with God. And what I want you to go away from here today to see is that this is a template for how God transitioned you out of whatever mess you and me found ourselves to be standing where we are today. And every time that we go through the process of sanctification and consecration all over again, this is the process. The Lord will come and identify the ways that we are in bondage and now begin to do what you know begin to push back by the blood this says it begins to push back so that the devil can take his hands off you so that you can move forward i want you to see this so that you understand that this is not just history we are not just studying history this is our lives and this is our future and I'm praying that God will open your eyes to see. And so that whatever you need to make amends for, you will make amends for them. And whatever I need to make amends for, I will be able to make amends for. My brothers and my sisters, this is um, Exodus chapter 8. The Lord continues to speak. The Lord wants to take you, uh, bring you out. Will you cooperate with him? Will you cooperate with him? That is the question. What is it that today will make it difficult for God to cut you loose from the, 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 the claws of the clutches of the devil? My prayer is that God will help us. He will open our eyes and we will see. And based on what we see, we will make the adjustments and we will go forward in the name of Jesus. Thank you for joining the, prayer, um, the broadcast this evening. Um, if you have questions, maybe you should ask me the questions, just send them to me. And maybe one of these days I'll take time and answer all the questions that you may have. It doesn't matter where the, um, what chapter it is. I'll do best to answer the questions, but in the teaching, we may not be able to do most of that, but yes, this is. This is um, Exodus chapter 8. I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you did not remember anything at all, I'm sure you would remember sin stinks. And even when you are forgiven, sometimes it stinks regardless because the consequences will show up. May God help us. Is there a prayer we want to pray this evening? It is yes. Father Lord, may I not compromise. May I not give the devil room to negotiate with me. May I stand upon my watch and not shift my ground to the glory of your name. And if you're on this broadcast and you've not given your life to Jesus, it bears reminding you that you need to give your life to Jesus. Because you can go on and on and say, but I don't, um, I go to church, I give offerings, I do all the things they ask us to do. All of those things is not how you come into kingdom. How you come into kingdom is by giving your life to Jesus, by saying these words with me this evening. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. So if you like to go to, uh, you know, give your life to Jesus, just say with me this evening, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life.
Lord Jesus, I give you my life. For the rest of us, pray. Father, Lord, may I not compromise. May not, I not allow the devil to shift me to the place that I begin to take his suggestions over your instructions. Lord, may I not take the devil's suggestions over my over your instructions in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining the broadcast today. Our time is up. I'll see you next week, Wednesday with um, Exodus chapter nine, if Jesus tarries. I, it will get really interesting. The book of Exodus will get really interesting and really, really interesting as we go. But you see, we don't study the word of God for interest anyway. We study the word of God to get a revelation and templates by which we run our lives. So um, keep it a date with me next week, um, Wednesday at 7 p.m. when we study the next chapter. Thank you so much for doing this with me. God bless you and have a good night. Bye-bye.